Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. As Jane just said, I'm going to talk you through growing combining bees. Just to start with, a quick thought about benefits of bees in the rotation. Like all bird crops, uh, bees give an opportunity for disease break for cereal crops. They also offer different crop protection options that can be used, that can't be used in cereals to give different modes of actions. But what is unique to pulses is that they show that they have nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen fixation is the use of atmospheric nitrogen that via the nodules and the bacteria that live in them is made in a usable form for the plants. So the, nitro so the pulse crops, so peas, do not need any nitrogen fertilization. Not only that, they leave some of the nitrogen behind. And this can be seen as yield benefits in following cereal crops of up to 0.8 or 0.9 tons per hectare. Additionally, peas give you the option for homegrown protein crops. Their grain contains about 20 to 24% of protein content. And this can be used, for example, for uh, animal feed. There's also the possibility that peas can improve the soil microbial community. Peas show very strong associations with beneficial microbes. Mycorrhiza, um, rhizobia, as I've mentioned, so they foster a different microbiome than some of the other crops and can therefore help to diversify the soil microbial community. And generally speaking, as I mentioned above, gross margins of legume rotations can exceed non-legume rotations due to lower inputs and the positive pre-crop effects. There's approximately 35,000 hectares of combining pea growth grown annually, and they are yielding a roughly three and a half to four tons per hectare on average. There's two distinct markets. One is for animal feed. And as you can see in, in the picture, the peas are micronized and then flaked for animal feed, or they can be used directly as compound feed. The other one is human consumption. And for these ones, it's mainly the marrowfat peas and the bluefoot peas that we are talking. So they are used for snacks in the UK, as you can see, Hockmadots is one of the British companies using peas and producing snacks from them, but also in the Far East. And uh, the British grown uh, Marofat peas are very well thought after. Peas are also used for soups and thickeners and the original mushy peas, of course. What is important to note is that peas are grown on contract. So you should always pay attention to the contract details. And um, just to let you know, if you're new to peace and you're interested, I know that for this year, there's still contracts out there. So just contact your local merchant and get an idea whether what kind of conditions are um, associated to them. What is really important with regard to humans on peace is the color retention. There's a huge difference between the value of the peas on the left when they retain their green color or the ones on the right that have bleached. So we as, um, recommend to harvest early at a moisture content of about 80, 18% to avoid bleaching and then dry the peas down. The next bit I'm going to talk about is varieties and seed quality. PGO um, has recently switched to a descriptive list of combining peas. What is important to note is that we haven't changed the number of sites. So we are still looking at as, as many sites and as many data as we did with the recommended list. The advantage that the descriptive list might give us is that we can add additional characteristics to the varieties. Another change is that the yield controls, which used to be a two specific varieties, are now a combination of all year four and year five entries which gives a more stable yield control. And the last change, we are now using international categories. So internationally, white peas are called yellow peas and blue peas are called green peas. So now we are using yellow and green as well. And then of course we have the two um, niche ones, maple peas and marofat peas. This is an example of the combining pea descriptive list from this year for yellow peas. 
And you can see the percentage in comparison to the yield control, yellow peas are the higher yielding ones. But you can find all the information that you had on the recommended list as well and some additional ones. If we, for example, take the resistances, we have not only pea wilt in downy mildew, but we also have information on powdery mildew now. We have protein content, and at the end of the slide, you can see how many years the pea variety has been on the matrix and the year it was first listed. This is an overview of all of the combining peas we have descriptive list this year. This is just to show you how some of the characteristics differ. In blue, you have the yield. And as you can see, maple and Harford peas are the ones that uh, tend to yield lower. In black, you have down mildew resistance. The higher the number, the more resistant the variety is to down mildew. And this is important um, with regards to seed treatment, which I will come back to later. It is really good to see that most of the varieties now have a six, seven, or eight, so very good, fairly good resistances to downy mildew, which means you don't rely on a seed treatment as much. Another thing to note, for example, if we look at Blumen, which has very high downy mildew writing of eight, it is also very resistant to powdery mildew. So if disease resistance is um, of, for, you, for your concern, then Blumen is a variety to go to. Other things to note is that the size of peas differ. So for example, with regards to the marrowfats, Akuma is a, very, um, is a bigger size than any of the other ones. If size matters, Akuma is a variety to go to. The next point is seed quality. It is important to get your germination tested, as it is with all of the other um, crops you're growing as well. There are abnormal seedlings in peas that can happen due to mechanical damage, hollow heart, or glyphosate damage. If glyphosate is used to desiccate the crop, this has a severe effect on germination. And this is, as the longer it has been on the crop, the greater the effect, it can lead to complete well, basically loss of seed, less than 10% germination. So it's important never to use glyphosate on any of the peas that you want to farm safe for growing on. Another thing with peas is they can suffer from marsh spot. This is hollowing out of the, um, no, it's um, the, the browning of the cotyledons, as you can see in the bottom left picture. And this is caused due to manganese deficiency. So if you are growing on high pH land, where you know that there is a history of potential manganese deficiencies, then we recommend you fertilize at flowering with manganese solvent. There's two seed-borne pathogens, Ascochyta pisa and Didymella pinodes. And these two pathogens can be tested for in seed labs. And testing has been very successful. We basically never see any of the seed infected with either of these two pathogens anymore because screening has been so vigorous and it just shows how important this is for overall seed quality. The next point I would like to talk about is establishment. For plant populations, this is the calculation you, you can use to calculate your seed rate. Thousand seed rate, either um, the best way would be to determine it from your own seed log, or you can go to the average thousand seed weight of the variety, and then the target plant population in square meters. And we say for marrowfat peats, the target plant population is 65 to maximum 70 plants per square meter, whereas the yellow and green peats require a slightly higher one. We are working on it at the moment, but the indication is that 75 to 85, so the higher ranges, uh, give better returns for yellow and green peas. You divide this by the percentage germination that you uh, can determine using seed labs, and then you keep, need to keep um, field losses into account. So the earlier soon the peas are, the more field loss it is to be expected. And in the bottom, you can see early sown peas, we recommend to allow for 18% seed uh, germination loss then March 13 and in April around 7%. What is really critical with regards to peas is soil conditions. They are very sensitive to compaction and water logging. These conditions lead to reduced emergence, can lead to increased disease risk, 
reduced root development modulation and reduced yields. So you can see in the picture on the bottom right, this is a pea crop standing underwater. If this disappears within under 24 hours, the crops often recover. Anything more than 48 hours, and this will probably lead to complete crop losses. On the bottom left, this is an example where you can see how compaction and then the impact of foot rot, which I'm going to mention in a minute, can really destroy the whole area of the field. You can see to the right, the main field is green, but this, this headland in the side is completely um, yellow. The plants have died off. With regards to establishment, we have done some cover crop work in vining peas over the last few years. So we used black oats in combination with either all radish, fascilia, bersin clover, and had winter veg as a standalone monocrop cover crop to see whether legume uh, species can be included into, in this case, vining pea rotations. This work was done together with the Green Pea Company, Bird's Eye, and funded by ERP Agri, and Elsons provided the seed for it. What we consistently saw was a very positive effect of cover crops onto soil moisture. This is an example from 2019 <clears throat> where we monitored soil moisture from the end of January when the cover crops were spray off, sprayed off due to the end um, uh, middle of July when the peas were harvested. And you can see that throughout the season the oat and so the, the soil that had been under the oat and clover cover crop had higher soil moisture than the control treatment. And these soil moisture differences, especially at drilling, but also during pot fill, were significantly correlated with improved yields at the end of the season. What we have also seen in some cases is the positive effect of oat residues, so-called saponins. Oats have saponins in their tissues, and saponins are known to be to have antimicrobial um, activity. So the picture on the left shows a glasshouse experiment where we grew peas in soil that was infected with foot rot pathogens, and these pea on the on the left had been grown in soil where um, oat straw was mixed under, and the other one wasn't. And you can see the control ones, the roots are thinner, they are blacker. This is a sign for foot rot. So the um, oat residues protected the, the piece to some extent from foot rot development. And this is also something that we could see sometimes translate into, into yield. This is uh, the figure on the, on the right. This was in a field where there was some foot rot present. And the cover crops reduced the disease severity in the field, and we saw up to one and a half a ton per hectare yield increases on a field that was already doing very well. So as an overview, we recommend cover crop early, ideally mid-August, at the very latest mid-September. The earlier that you go, the more likely the cover crop will develop the required biomass. If you drill too late and the plants stay really small, then the biomass and the root mass is too low to actually make, make a big difference. We also recommend to destroy cover crops latest six weeks prior to drilling peas. This is to give the material time to decay the, the, and for the soil surface to um, develop a, a good moisture content and a good term um, tilt. We recommend to use oat-based cover crop mixtures. We have no reason to believe that rye wouldn't work. We just haven't tested it. And one of the advantages with oat is that it doesn't share um, a lot of the, the common cereal diseases. Good partners are fascilia, but also clover or veg. We have seen no negative impact of the inclusion from bersium clo clover or winter veg on, on foot rot development in any of the fields in any of the years where we have done the work. What we have seen though is that oil radish seems to have some kind of negative effect sometimes on disease development, so foot rot development in the field. We don't really know why this is the case, but because of it, we have seen it more than once. For the time being, we avoid to, um, we recommend to avoid using oil radish prior to peace. 
The next bit to talk about is weed control. And the first picture shows, to, shows you as to why pre-emergence weed control in peace is so important. Peace are not particularly competitive, and these two pictures are taken in the same field. This was an experiment um, on the left side, the control on the right, uh, it had received a pre-emergence herbicide, and you can see what, what a difference it makes. With regards to pre m options, Nirvana and pendamethalin is probably one of the is one of the best pr products that we recommend. The full rate is four and a half liters per hectare it's for broadleaf weed control. Um, we would say use do not drop rates below three and a half. Four liters um, in most cases is is ideal. Gives you really good control of your broadleaf weeds. Other options are pendamethalin. Penamethylin, Stomp Aqua, for example, full rate is 2.9 liters per hectare. At, depending on what the conditions are like, and if you have a rainfall after application, penamethylin can cause um, some plant damage, um, as, as you can see in the top right picture. Uh, um, but not, if the damage isn't too bad, then the, then the peas normally outgrow it. If you have specific problems like cleavers, chickweed, or shepherd's purse, then uh, centium, so clomazone, is a good product to add in. Full rate is 0.25 liters per hectare. We would say do not drop rates lower than 0.2 liters per hectare because then the product really loses efficacy. In addition to being good on the um, weeds I just mentioned, Adding clomazone just seems to give an additional control in mixes generally for other broadleaf species as well. And then there's the product, um, a mixture already um, from pendamethalin and clomazone, stallion syntec, which full rate is three liters per hectare. Pre-emergence weed control is so important in peace because we are very limited with post-emergence broadleaf weed control options. There's only two active ingredients. The first one is bentazone. There's two products remaining. The first one is Bazagran SG at full rate 1.1 kilogram per, per hectare or Benta 480 at three liters per hectare. Bentazone works best on small weeds, but be aware of the temperature restrictions. It needs to have some warmth to be working, so a low to mid teens are required. But as soon as temperatures get towards 20, 21 degrees, then you will see um, really strong crop effects. So do not spray when temperatures are predicted to go to 20 or 20, uh, over 20, 21 degrees. The other active ingredient is MCPB, tropotrax at four and a half liters per hectare. It's a hormone which is really good on thistles, oil seed drives, or dogs. But for MCPB, it's important to do not spray it too late. If you spray when buds are already uh, starting to form, then you have um, the danger of uh, bud abortion, as you can see in the picture, and then uh, no flowers, of course, can form. There's the typical graminicides options in peas as well. Um, falcon is always a good one if you have issues with annual meadow grass. Laser Fusillate Max for wild oats or Leopard 5EC is another option. I've just mentioned Bentazone, and this is the most used um, post M in peace. And BSF have come up with the Bentazone stewardship guidelines. The reason for this is that Bentazone is widely detected in surface water, is detected every month, more often and more widespread than any other pesticide. And although groundwater is generally seen to be more or less free of pesticide, bentazone is the most detected pesticide in groundwater. It is the, therefore really critically important. The Environment Agency need to see over the next few years that there are reductions of bentazone in water if we are, if we are wanting to keep the product. If they don't see any reductions, then the danger is that the that bentazone will not be renewed, and this would be would uh, be a big hit for the post-emergence weed control, not only in peas but also in other plants. So the guidelines say that the maximum dose is 1,000 grams per hectare. 
It recommends to only use from April onwards during spring and summer. And there's two uh, tables at the bottom. The first one is to establish if you are in a high risk uh, location. So drinking um, water, groundwater, safeguard zone or um, protection zones once or two. If you're in a high risk area and um, your soil conditions are, as you can see on the left hand side, shallow, shallow or low organic matter soils, then do not use. Even in other non-high risk areas on these soil types, if you can avoid use, then please do so. Do not use bentazone if heavy rainfall is likely within the next 48 hours. If drains are flowing, then avoid, um, avoid the use if possible. And if we all work together on this, then there should hopefully be a reduction in the um, levels detected in water, which will hopefully mean that we can keep the um, active in the crop. The next bit I'm going to talk to you about is disease control. The first disease are foot rots. I mentioned them already. They are probably the biggest disease problem in peace. Foot rots are caused by three different pathogens. The first one is Fusarium solani, and it's characterized by reddening of the vascular tissue. It is very widespread in the UK and probably the dominant one of the three. The second one is Didymella pinodella, which leads, leads to blackening of the stem base, as you can see in the picture on the right. It, Didymella seems to worsen the impact of the other two pathogens if they are present together, but it can also on its own have quite a strong effect. The third one is Aphromyces eutychis, which leads to soft root and honey colored. It's the dominant one in Scotland, but also widespread in England. The difference is Aphromyces eutychis is an oomycete, whereas the other two are true fungi. And this is why Aphromyces spreads very easily when there is water present because the long lasting resting spores release those spores which can actively swim and therefore um, spread through the fields a lot easier than the other two. So conditions for disease development for food are good and bad soils. Poor soil structure, anything like compaction and water logging that is stressful for the crop helps food rots to develop. The reason is that stress plants with these root exudates that these um, pathogens detect, um, which makes them germinate, infect the plants. So one of the main reasons for increased foot rot de um, development is frequent legume cropping. So if you look at the picture at the top, this is a picture that has been given to me by a colleague in Canada. And this field used to be split into two. So the farmer used the whole field for peas in this year because the prices for peas were so good. The bits that you can see that are basically dead, all yellow, this is um, part of the field that had been in peas uh, four years prior, whereas the green part on the top left was virgin land. And you can see just by driving the tractor in, just by compacting some of the lines, how easy it is to contaminate your fresh land with the oospores because they just live in soil, they're transported by machinery. So any hygiene, best soil conditions, good soil conditions are the only things that you can do to prevent the foot rot from spreading. There are no chemical controls available. One thing that we offer at PGO are soil tests to determine the risk levels of foot rot pathogens based on the presence of the resting spores in soil. So we give you an individual and a combined risk score for the three pathogens. So we let you know not only which pathogens are there, but how they form their own risk individually. And if you have, for example, a low level of Aphromyces fusarium and Didymella at the same time individually, then of course the combined risk is greater depending either medium or high. So I would highly recommend if you are growing peas regularly to have your uh, fields tested for the presence of um, these pathogens. We, you can do the tests up to a year and a half prior to planting peas because these resting spores survive in the soil for quite some time and it will help you to decide which fields to avoid high risk fields to leave out of um, pea crops for, for longer. 
The next disease to talk about is downy mildew. Downy mildew leads to these um, gray mycelium, the fluffy growth of, on the underside of the leaves. Downy mildew is probably one of the, the second most um, important disease in, in combining bees. As you can see from the list though, and as I mentioned before, there are big variety resistance differences. Um, so we would recommend if you grow it early, or if you grow in an area that you know is prone to downy mildew risk, pick a variety that has um, a six or above. With regards to um, chemical control, at the moment, we still have the seed treatment Vacalexel. However, Vacalexel has all already a restriction and can only be used on crops sown between the 1st of April and the 29th of September. So if you're drilling early in March, which is the high risk time for downy mildew anyway, you can't use Vacalexel. What also is very likely to happen is um, that the use of seed treatments containing metalaxylam will be restricted to indoor use only from the 1st of June this year, which means from next year onwards in combining peace, we won't have any um, seed treatment available anymore. We don't have any foliar treatments either. And this is why I thought um, I show you uh, some of the results we had in spring beans, where we tested a variety of um, different biostimulant products on spring bean downy mildew. And this was in one year where we saw that FOS, which contains phosphite, um, reduced the infection by spring bean downy mildew significantly. And it is known that um, phosphites can have an effect on oomycetes. And I just wanted to let you know that we are looking at alternative products, including phosphites, to see whether we can find something for downy mildew control in peace. To other diseases, we try to clarity. Both favored by wet weather at petal fall. And um, because the spores land on the petals, which then land on the developing pots, and from there the infection spreads. The only ways to control are preventative sprays. So we recommend to spray if changeable weather is forecast, because under wet conditions, these diseases, uh, under, sorry, dry conditions, these diseases don't develop. So treatment is not justified when there is a prolonged period of dry weather forecast during flowering. However, if there is rain forecast, then spray during flowering at first pot. And if um, weather remains to be unstable, potentially spray 10 to 14 days later. Azoxystrobin or saprolinyl and frodioxinil are good on both diseases. If you are only dealing with the risk of botrytis, then boscalid and paratrostrobin or metconazole also work. The last disease to talk about, which is of increasing importance over the last years, it seems, is powdery mildew. It's a late season disease. It comes in in July or August. It's favored by warm days and humid nights. And as you can see, it's this gray um, grows over the whole of the plant, and there are varietal differences. Uh, as you can see in the top right, the variety plot that was there in the middle, although everything around it was basically covered in powdery mildew, it remained fairly clean. And this is one of the information that we are giving in our descriptive lists. There are protective sprays available. They are sulfur-based. At the moment, there are two EMUs, Microthial Special and Cyopron, Thiopron is a liquid formulation. Microsyl especially the emo runs out at the end of September this year, but Thiopron has just been granted, so this will be available for the years to come. The next bit to talk about is pest control. The first one is PNB. This is an early pest that leads to the um, notching on the leaves that you're probably familiar with seeing, but this is not the main issue. The problem with PMB and Weevil is that the larvae burrow into the nodules that are forming on, on the pulse crops and destroy the nodules and thereby reduce the nitrogen fixation ability of the crop. However, spraying for um, PMB and Weevil is rarely justified. This is for two reasons. Because the although it looks like the damage is quite great from the nodging of the um, 
of the leaves, this doesn't necessarily mean that the effects on the roots will be great. And this is why we recommend to use a trap system where you place five traps in the field, either of in the margins of the previous um, crop or if you're growing for the first time in the current crop by mid-February. We recommend to check the traps three times per week and the threshold is quite high. You need an average of 30 weevils per trap. So if this is the case, if you have um, reached the threshold and then see notching in the crop over um, within the 10 days of the threshold, then we say you can spray with pyrethroids. That's the only um, active that, that is um, approved. However, there are increasing resistance issues with regards to PMB and weevil. So if you don't see an effect after the first spray, don't spray again because then it's likely that you have a resistant weevils in the population and you would only be making it worse. The next one is PMOS, which um, we also have a very good uh, monitoring system available. So these traps are available from Coppered Undermat and Dragonfly, and we recommend to place them in the crop in early May. This has changed this year. We, we used to say from mid-May onwards, but over the last two years, we have seen PMOS um, coming into the crops in greater numbers earlier due to the, to the warmer springs, the general warmer weather. So we now say place the uh, traps into the um, crops in early May. The threshold is then 10 moss recorded on two consecutive occasions. This is not your spray date though. The Once you have reached the threshold, we would you need then to go to the PGO website or give us a call to get your um, spray date because this is predicted by the model based on um, uh, temperature um, after you've re they reached the threshold of 10, 10 moss on two consecutive occasions. Pyrethroids, deltamethrin and lambda thialothrin are um, approved. Do not use cypermethrins because um, they are harmful to bees and cannot be used during flowering crop. The next one is aphids and viruses. Aphids, the main problem with them is virus transmission. There's two viruses, P and Nation mosaic virus, virus and P streak virus, which are um, very dominant in the crops. These are the pictures on the right of the screen. The top one is P and Nation and the bottom one P streak. But we also found out with a current product that we, a project that we are running with FERA, that turnip yellow virus is far more widespread in peas than we thought. With regards to aphid control, it's difficult. There's always bi biological control to, to keep in mind. So to the more you can do to help the beneficials um, in, in, in the crop, this is um, always a good start to have help because we are very limited with regards to um, products. Perimicab is still approved in um, combining peas. So there's four products available and it is very good on pea aphid. However, it doesn't have any effect on misos persicae, so the pea pota peach potato aphid anymore. So this is why we say use Perimicab to control the pea aphid. So when the big colonies are forming and um, it's one application only, um, and we are working on um, potentially other options to find for the early aphid control with, uh, with regards to misos and the first P aphids that come in, which are important for um, virus transmission. The last bit to talk about is harvest. Um, harvest age to be precise. So on the what you would like to see if you have still conditions like on the in the picture on the left, where the, the, some of the peas are still green, you would like to have something that helps you get the crop to the picture on the right fairly quickly. And we used to have dicot that could do that, but dicot is not available anymore. The second option, why you would like to, why would you ask, is if you have a very weedy crop at harvest, as you can see, this was one of the trials we actually had last year, the peas were ready, but it was completely overgrown with weeds. So this is why we are doing the desiccation trials. And I can't give you the products that we were testing, 
But I just wanted to, to show you the overview. So the, as you can see, Raglon, so diquat, um, the crop was spread on the 8th of August and four days later, 90% of the crop had senesce. And this is what diquat was used for. And as you can see, we know that uh, glyphosate is a lot slower and all of the other products, the same thing. So we, there is nothing at the moment that we can see coming that would be able to fill the gap that, that diquat is leaving. However, if wheat pressure is um, your, your um, main concern and you are not growing for seed, then glyphosate is an option. For seed crops where you can't use glyphosate, there was an emergency approval in 2020 for cafentrazone ethyme, and we are awaiting decision for 21 whether this will be available again. And the last slide um, to give you an overview about PN. PN has been running since 2017, and it is seen as, as a form for just to compare where you are standing with, with your crops and for the growers and us and aiders to, to, to use the data to see how can combining P yields generally be, be um, increased. The potential yields that have been calculated within PN are six to 10 tons per hectare, but we are not getting anywhere near to these um, yields in real life. So the average yields of even the good crops within uh, the PEM program are around 50% of the calculated yield potentials. So, so some of the things that have been coming out um, from the data based on the 2019 and 2020 entries is that plant population. So plants per square meter and also seeds per square meter are strongly linked with yield. What they also found is that soil pea content and some of the foliar nutrients at an early growth stage um, were also correlated with the higher yielding crops. So if you're interested, um, we would um, like to encourage you to join PN, visit the websites either by ADAS or send them an email. And there are still entries available for 21. So if you're interested, please get in touch. And last slide, uh, my contact details. If you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch via email or phone. And also remember on the PGO website, we have lots of information, the agronomy guide, our PGO app, as I mentioned, the descriptive list, summary and technical reports, and PGO gives advice. We have the free crop clinic for uh, members. We send out the parts market updates, crop updates, and we also run a seed laboratory. So thank you very much for your time this morning, and I hope you found the presentation helpful. Thank you very much, Leah. That was uh, fantastic. I know there was an awful lot to cover there, so, so thank you. Um, we've got some great questions that have come through, so I'm going to dive straight into those. And, and like, if you have any more to add anyone, please use um, Slido, the website, or the chat function. So first question, can peas be direct drilled into cover crop residue? We haven't done it directly. So this was never part of our um, vining pea work, but I have spoken to some of the growers that have tried it. It really strongly depends on your soil type. On, on heavier soil types, it doesn't seem to be possible because then the, then the topsoil can be too wet. And it also it depends a little bit on um, what kind of equipment you have and things like this. So I, I don't want to say no, because there's just not enough people that have tried it. It's just peas are very sensitive if the, the topsoil is too wet. They are not very competitive if there's still of a lot of green material available. So this is why if, if you spray the cover crops off early enough and then um, make sure that there's no green matter left on the top, then definitely yes, um, it, it is possible, but um, keep the, your soil type in mind as well. But yeah. I know from people who have successfully directly drilled combining pea crops. And I went to one field last year 
um, no, 2019, sorry, actually. And it was one of the best pea fields I had seen this year because the peas really took advantage of the soil moisture that was available due to direct drilling in the, in the dry spring of 2019 we had. So yeah, it is possible. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next question, are there any other factors that will influence bleaching of peas other than harvest state and moisture content? It's mainly the weather conditions. So if you have um, changes of dry days and humid nights, this is one of the factors that leads to bleaching quite quickly. Also storage conditions can play a role. So make sure that the peas are not exposed to um, any daylight. Make sure that there is no um, moisture in, in the storage conditions because this can lead to bleaching as well. Great, thank you. Uh, an establishment question here. How would you describe a good seed bed? Hmm. Yep. Um, you will know more about your own farm, what a good seed bed is. There is no one answer. What I can say in general is, as I said before, be careful with compaction. Any compaction is a problem. What peas also don't like is if there's very cloddy seed beds. There's, this helps the pea and bean weevil to get around. It's also more difficult for soil seed compact, contact. So we recommend a fine tilt, but not too fine. So don't overwork the soil. Soil temperature, um, peas like it to be at least, if possible, around uh, seven degrees soil temperature. So go by temperature rather than by date, if you can. Um, moisture, good seed soil contact, adequate moisture is important. And not too heavy soils. Peas don't like really, really heavy clays. Actually, just um, related to what you've just uh, said there, how deep should peas be sown? And is there a minimum soil temperature recommended for sowing? Depths, I think we say three inches, but this is something I would need to check. Um, I'm not 100% sure of that, but I think it's about five, five to seven centimeters that we say. And soil temperature, yeah, around five to seven degrees, ideally. Okay, thank you. Um, so just a disease related question now. How is disease incidence changing with the recent extremes of dry and wet weather? that we've been seeing through the season? One of the main things we have been noticing in peace is the um, higher incidence of powder mildews. Because we have really often now these, these hotter periods in, in summer and then the humid nights, so powder mildew definitely seems to be increasing. On the other hand, botrytis and sclerotinia, at least in, in England, in, in, in Scotland is slightly different, but in England, um, they seem to be decreasing. I have not really seen that much of botrytis in, in a lot of, uh, of the recent years. Foot rot is very, very year dependent, but unfortunately, foot rots can make use of most conditions. Because sometimes when I, when, when I thought we have a really, really dry spring, so they don't like dry conditions, so we're expecting not necessarily to have too much of a foot rot problem. And then, for example, I think this was either 2018 or 2019, when around mid-June, around cereals time, we had this really, really wet weather, and the foot rots took off from there. The plants were already flowering, but we still had a huge impact there. So I think the biggest differences are more powdery mildew and less botrytis. Okay, thank you. Um, we've just got a couple more questions coming through. So if anyone has any uh, final questions to add, this is your chance to get them in for Leah. Um, so Leah, have you considered uh, applying for an EMU or INSYST, or has the industry uh, considered applying for an EMU or INSYST? The, um, I think it's active primarid, <laughs> if I pronounced that correctly. The, the active hasn't even gone through um, approval yet. So this is why I would like not to answer that question for the time being. Um, and then this is a, a BSF-directed question, I would say. 
would BASF expect signum to control sclerotinia? So uh, the short answer is yes, yes, we would. Um, so it's not directly on the label, but um, we would expect control of sclerotinia from signum. Um, I think that is about all the questions that we've got coming through there. Just while we um, wait to see if there's any uh, more final ones coming through, I don't know if you saw the note from Roger Vickers in the chat, but ventosone stewardship, um, really, really, really critical because we don't want to lose the active. So please do look out for the next issue of the PGRO magazine pulses. And there's a special feature in there about ventosone stewardship. So we, we really would encourage you to, to please read that, make sure you're familiar with those um, recommendations so we can really uh, do what we can to reduce those levels and keep the active at the next registration. So I think that is about it from us. Um, any other questions? Leah's uh, contact details were up before. Um, so it's leah at pgro.org um, if any, any questions for Leah there. And um, also obviously get in touch with your BSF contact as well and we can try and help you. And all that leads me to say is the basis points, please look out for the next slide, which has got the code on for you. And we'd love to have you back for our next live stream, which is on Tuesday on Zavio, our digital farming tool. So thank you very much, Leah. I think we'll, we'll leave it there. And uh, yeah, everyone uh, wish you all the best of luck for the upcoming season, especially if you've uh, got Palm Wedding Peas going in. Thank you.